Welcome back to my channel, my name is Olive and today on Podcast with Olive we have my beautiful friend Jazz with me. Hello! <laughs> um, so welcome, thank you for joining and travelling so so far. <laughs> I've come such a long way such today. A long way. Such a long way. <laughs> the inside joke is that Jazz has been um, living with me for the past couple of weeks so it's been a real tough journey. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm amazed I got here on time to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> if anything I was holding you up. <laughs> It's just one of those things. <laughs> so Jazz, to kind of like dive straight into it, mm. do you want to tell me a little bit about yourself in terms of what you do in the movement sphere? Yeah, for sure, for sure. So I'm a vinyasa yoga teacher primarily. Um, I also teach yin yoga and yoga nidra and I have a real focus on kind of breath-led movement ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, I think that so often in the kind of the yoga sphere um we focus so much on you know hitting certain postures all the time and i really try to recenter us to kind of actually be led by the breath and that's the most important thing i think mm -hmm. um, there's a matt strong quote where he says that we're doing breath practice with postures not the other way around and when i first heard that i was like oh my god <laughs> brain blown um so yeah i i teach public classes mostly. Um, I really enjoy leading people through uh, self-investigation. Mm. Um, so using the practice as a tool to know yourself better and like observe yourself and observe your own mental space, emotional space, like perhaps your spiritual space as well. Um, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the kind of main thing that I do. Yeah, and you're quite a curious person by nature anyway, mm. so to see that you want your students to experience a similar kind of thing is really nice. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a nice thing. No, it, well, <laughs> it's, so, it's so true. I'm not just like, you know me, I don't find that mm. compliments easy. <laughs> 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 but I mean it, and um, like your curious nature with everything. I remember like when we were sat down a couple of weeks ago, just like looking at stuff, like mm. the amount that your brain can retain is really, really like impressive. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> God damn, she's such a like wealth of knowledge. It's really cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think I definitely do have a skill to retain information. And I, I, I was an actor for a, mm. a, 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 an amount of time. Like I trained as an actor, that was my background. And for years, probably from when I was a kid until I was maybe in my mid twenties, I was like, that's what I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be an actor. Um, so there's a certain amount of skills that you learn as an actor that are all about retaining information. So I think that that's kind of stood me in quite good stead. Mm -hmm. um, I've also grew up in a, in a household and a family that always encouraged us to like question a lot of stuff and to think in a critical way and not just kind of like take things at face value. So that curiosity has kind of just been embedded in me, I think, from like a quite young age. Yeah. So your like upbringing and your sort of experience within the acting world has influenced your teaching like now? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I wouldn't actually be a teacher if I hadn't been an actor. Oh, really? Yeah. So um, I never really felt that connected to my body as a child. Okay. Um, and it was really through acting and through the kind of physical theatre route, because that was the kind of the main type of acting that I was interested in so like a non-typical style of acting where you're using your body a lot more to tell the story basically mm -hmm. rather than it just being like here is a script now you must learn the script now you must be the character it was like a lot more kind of uh, non-linear than that I suppose mm -hmm. and um, it was at drama school that I really started diving into more physical practices um, we did a lot of like contact improvisation and expressive movement that wasn't necessarily um, dictated by any particular choreography or anything. It was all about like really connecting to your own body and your own like physical truth, as mm -hmm. it were. Um, and it was through that that I found yoga practice. Um, oh, that's so yeah. interesting yeah. how they've kind of come together. And totally. I'm interested because with physical theatre, I can imagine mm -hmm. it's quite like non-linear, right? Mm -hmm. So how did you find the transition to teaching vinyasa, which can be super linear? Yeah, <laughs> it's really interesting actually that you ask that because I was thinking about this the other day. When I first started practicing yoga, I think the first class I ever went to was like my friend's class because she, she, she was teaching and she still is a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I remember, <laughs> I remember going in and being like, wow, I'm so flexible, I'm so good at this and like massaging my ego throughout the practice. And then kind of from there, I started to realize the sort of benefits of having a regular practice and started to explore my own movement types. And obviously, because of having this background in sort of more expressive movement and more creative movement for the kind of means of training the actor's body, but also a lot of the time you're like wanting to make use of theatre. So you're trying to convey something. 
I found that those two things um, met in a quite a beautiful way. So the creativity of my movement when it was a self-led practice was probably far greater than it is now when I'm teaching a vinyasa class. And I was thinking about this recently because when I first went into my teacher training, I would say I was a much more creative mover than I would maybe define myself as now. Oh. Um, and then it was kind of through learning the sort of Ashtanga model that things became a little bit more linear, I suppose. Um, and yeah, I was just kind of musing about this the other day because still when I step on my mat now, if I'm just moving intuitively, the movement patterns will be way more creative, yeah. way more expressive. Like I'm not just kind of moving from triangle pose into warrior <laughs> two into like half moon or like whatever. There's a real space for like exploration of the kind of interoception, the internal experience and feeling and understanding of the postures um then perhaps there is a maybe like a more linear structure yeah, yeah. um and i just thought that was interesting because i was like how can i bring more of that more of my own practice more of what i hope to find for myself when i'm in the poses into my practice when i'm teaching people because mm -hmm. you know i i think that people get very like tired of making decisions all the time and I think it can be very daunting for someone coming into a yoga room to have a teacher just go, cool, now just feel it and like do your thing, and move your body. And if you're not getting any guidance, especially if you don't have any kind of movement background or practice already established, even if you do have a practice already established, that can be incredibly daunting. Mm -hmm. So it's like trying to kind of bridge the gap and like walk the line of allowing people enough of a container that they feel held and enough boundaries that they feel safe to explore their own bodies. Um, whilst also you know offering guidance and space mm. for that as well yeah i think it is like you said it's a decision making process mm. also like decision fatigue these oh my god decision <laughs> fatigue. <laughs> so when you come to the yoga class like you just generally sometimes want to be told exactly what to do oh, exactly yeah. how to move your body mm -hmm. but like i think a really skilled teacher can hold space for both like mm. lead people into something but then be like once you're here if you would like to yeah it's all about language but for um, sure. I wanted to kind of go back a little bit to your previous point about mm. how you said that, how you wanted to bring your creativity of your own practice into the class. Mm. And I think something important that I felt for myself is that my practice is my practice and I don't have to teach how I practice because yeah. it's creating that boundary. Absolutely. Otherwise it gets too abashed and too like into like twoven and it's so hard to then be like, Oh, am I practicing for me anymore? Big time. Mm. Yeah, that's such a huge thing. I think I go through real phases and have been over the years and mm. really feeling like the practice is my practice and then really feeling like it's kind of a chore for me to feel connected to the practice so that I don't feel like a yeah. um, a fraud when I'm teaching. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, it's so true. There's been yeah. like phases where I didn't practice for like six months. Mm -hmm whether it was a time constraint or whether it was like an injury or like just not feeling like I wanted to practice. Yeah. Again, the decision fatigue. Mm. I mean, like, can I even say I'm a teacher? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I totally get that. I, I definitely feel that sometimes. Mm. Um, it's a really hard line to walk because when you're doing something often enough, and I experienced this with acting as well, like something that was once such a deep passion and a love mm. and something that you gain so much from outside of your like personal work system then becomes your work and the kind of magic can disappear a little bit um, when you start to understand the modalities of what's happening yeah. and when you start to understand the like neurobiology of what's going on in your in your brain and in your body when you're actually moving it can sort of detract from the the kind of shininess of whatever mm -hmm. it is that you're doing yeah um, and then to reconnect to that for yourself I think can be really hard yeah especially when like other things are involved like finance and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> like yeah i'm making money from my passion now which arguably is an incredible thing to be able to Absolutely. do like you know it's your passion it's your mm -hmm. hobby that's great in some regard but it also <laughs> can mean that the magic is taken away from it mm -hmm. sometimes yeah like we were literally discussing this morning like when you're ill and you <laughs> You're like, how do I navigate this? You're like, do I just push through it and teach the class because it's money and then make myself more ill and then be off for a longer period of time? Or do I like get cover? Yeah. And then what happens? And it's ultimately so difficult because 
you would hope that as teachers we're facilitating a space and empowering our communities mm -hmm. to um, make the decisions for themselves that are best for themselves like mm -hmm. if someone comes to class and they're like do you know what actually i'm feeling really really crap today um i might just take child's pose for the whole class or even if they show up and they're like do you know what i'm actually i'm actually going to go like i really don't feel keen for this yeah. like, i don't feel good to do this practice today mm -hmm. Then my advice is always going to be like, listen to your body, do mm -hmm. what feels best for you. Like, I'm not here to like whip you into shape or tell you what to do. Like, I'm here to help you um, facilitate a space where you can connect to your intuition a lot more. Mm -hmm. And um, it can feel very sort of hypocritical to be putting yourself in a position that might cause you a little bit of harm down the road because like you're not resting if you're ill, for instance. Mm -hmm. But then you're like, but I need to make that cash. <laughs> I need to make that money. I've got bills to pay. Have you not seen how expensive electricity is at the moment? <laughs> you know, so it can, it can make you feel like a bit of a hypocrite. And again, like yeah. fraud, because yeah. it's like... I'm not practicing what I preach. Exactly, so. yeah. Yeah, which is hard. Yeah. And it's like, it boils down to the industry. Like, it's mm. pretty poor in so many regards. Like, we don't have holiday pay. We exactly. don't have sick pay. Mm. Like, you, it's all fair and well saying to, like, someone who's self-employed as a yoga teacher like oh just take a break every six weeks it's like yeah. that's actually not that feasible no it's not and like i think sometimes you can think oh i'm not going to do that cover class or mm -hmm. like oh I'll, I'll just take that class off whatever whatever it's 30 quid this week that i'm losing out on yeah but then if you're like ill for a set of days that can then amount to like you know more than 100 pounds that you're losing out on yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, it does add up and I would like to be like I totally trust the universe man and the money will come another way and I do like I do firmly believe that to a certain extent of course. but then sometimes you just have to live in the 3d world <laughs> you know you can't just float around being a fairy all the time and then expect yeah. things to just yeah, yeah, yeah. work out perfectly for you oh, you know it's amazing I want to go on that like being a fairy which again <laughs> there is space for me there's definitely times where yeah. I felt like that but have you ever experienced being like mistreated in the industry because of this preconception that yoga teachers are big pushovers? Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it boils down to for me like a lack of communication from certain like studio or gym owners mm -hmm. um, where, you know, you think that you've got a solid job somewhere and then maybe they just stop talking to you or go see you or... And you're like, and okay. like oh, hi, I... Yeah. Uh, need to be paid do you yeah. still want me around then there's just like radio silence or whatever mm -hmm. um i don't know if that directly comes from a space of them being like oh she's a pushover right um i don't know if that's just maybe poor business practices yeah that can definitely um, be it as well but yeah i mean i think to a certain extent you know how much we're paid is probably not enough if you yeah. consider I was thinking about this the other day, I was telling somebody how many hours of work a week I do. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, but then hold on a second. There's also all of the travel that goes into that. Mm -hmm. There's all of the mental preparation that goes into mm -hmm. teaching a class and all of the energy that you have to like move yourself into a space where you're like, cool, I'm now going to lead a space for other people and like put myself second. That takes like energy. Oh um, also all the planning, if you're someone that plans your classes, mm -hmm. um, all the research, if you're someone that likes to introduce like new concepts, which I do, like mm -hmm. a big part of being a teacher for me is also being a student. And I'm really interested in different ways that I can like enrich the tapestry of my teaching to make it a more um, embodied practice for the people in that room. So, you know, there's a lot of time that goes into just teaching one hour, a one hour class. I think it's about three hours work yeah. in total, like, yeah. including like setup and closing as well. Yeah. Like with everything combined, it's about three hours. And yeah. You break it down. It's like, oh, I'm a minimum wage. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You're like, yeah. cool. And then you also think about it. There are also limited pockets of time in the day where you can actually teach the general public, right? Majority is in the yeah. evening, sometimes in the morning. Yeah. If you're lucky, maybe it's like in the middle of the day. Exactly. So you think about it, you're like, okay, great. The best possible scenario is if you want to work a five day week, mm. five evenings, maybe like five mornings. Mm. That is exhausting. It is. And to get like minimum wage from yeah. it. Like, yeah. I think that's the biggest thing um, when people come to me and they're like, oh my God, it's amazing what you're doing. Like, mm you know, doing this or they come for advice because they're stepping into being a new teacher. Yeah. I'm like, look man, it's not all like sunshines and rainbows and like however Instagram promotes no. it. It's fucking hard work. For sure. And it's so exhausting, not only mentally, but physically on your body as well. 
Big time, big time. I think I've suffered more injuries since being a yoga teacher than I have at any, any period of my life. Um, I just like a sissy cry when I was talking to a friend the other day and they were like, when you wake up in the morning, do you like ache? I was like, yeah, obviously I do. I'm like, yes, I, I ache. Like, yes, things hurt. I'm not just like floating around perfectly fluid and like live and limber all the time. That's like absolutely not the case. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's funny as well. You briefly touched on the like whole Instagram thing. And, mm. Oh my God. I think a huge, there's, there's so many benefits to the mm. exposure that yoga has gotten from the instant yogis, but there is also so much, there's so many like favors that it has not done not to the like industry it. and to mm -hmm. the people practicing and practitioners alike. Like, mm -hmm. um, the the kind of world that Instagram makes yoga look like is um, is just so far removed from the actual practice, I think a lot of the time. And when it comes to people wanting to be teachers, I think, you know, I speak for myself when I say that, you know, there were teachers I was watching, people like Steffi White or like a bunch of the like Allo Yoga people, mm -hmm. or like whoever it might be, like on online who had like massive following looked super happy super fulfilled they were sharing like you know beautiful flows and like mm -hmm. lovely like philosophical chats that made it seem like they had got their shit together and everything figured out and when you're someone that really craves that and you do not have your shit together or at least in your own mind you don't have your shit together and you don't have your stuff figured out um that's really really seductive yeah so i think you know that was a big part of me becoming a yoga teacher that was like and it's going to be perfect when I'm teaching yoga. Mm -hmm. Like I'll just get to go from studio to studio and drink green smoothies every day and mm -hmm. um, be really lovely to people and get to like nourish people. And granted that like to some extent that is true. Mm -hmm. I don't drink a green smoothie every day. <laughs> More <laughs> on that later. <laughs> I, 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 I <laughs> but you know, there's, there's a lot more that goes into being a teacher that people don't realize. And it's actually, and we've spoken about this before, like it's a potentially very lonely business to be in. Yeah, um, absolutely. Which is why, you know, part of why I feel so lucky to have so many friends, like good friends as well, that are also yoga teachers. Because mm -hmm. I think if you don't, then it is really hard. It's so hard. It's really hard. Because mm -hmm. you're like, well, who are my colleagues that I talk to about X amount of problems? Yeah. yeah. That's why um, Grace and I, Grace Burns, who lives mm -hmm. up in Liverpool, mm -hmm. We finished our teacher training and flew home on the same flight. Yeah. And because we started our journey at the same point, we would leave each other voice notes mm -hmm. like, about the same kind of stuff that was occurring in yeah. parallel in two different cities. And it made it was easier to then like navigate certain things. And mm -hmm. we had problems with like a studio or like a weird like interaction with the student. It was someone mm -hmm. that I had to like communicate with. Yeah. But that's why I'm so grateful for like again. Like you said, everyone from Luna Wave. Yeah. Luna Wave is a studio that we both used to teach mm -hmm. at and where Jazz and I got quite close. To be able to have that community and that backwards and forwards, mm -hmm. it's just been like headspace. Yeah, it's priceless. Headspace. Yeah. It's priceless. Because like... it is a lonely job. Yeah. And when you think about it as well, kind of going back, like you're not just a yoga teacher, you're <laughs> also like a marketing individual. Expert. Expert. You have to be an expert. <laughs> be an expert. And it's like, wow you're also like a content creator unfortunately yeah. in this current world that we live in like you have to be a good content creator as For well sure. if you For want sure. to like you know push in that kind of way i'm not saying you have to do it but it's no. also a lot of people it's think you do totally and i think that there are a lot of teachers perhaps from the generation above us mm. that have gotten away with maybe not having to create so much content yeah um but I, I definitely feel like I wouldn't be where I am if it hadn't have been for going into the lockdown straight after I graduated and then just being forced into a space where I was like, well, I can't teach people in real life. Mm. Like my aim was to go into being a full time yoga teacher and building that up straight away and I couldn't do it. So I was like, right, well, maybe I'll just learn about marketing. Maybe I'll just mm -hmm. start putting my stuff online. Maybe if I get a bit bigger kind of uh, community of people that are aware of me in the online space, then that will in some way translate to mm. more success in the 3D space, which isn't actually directly true. Um, however, I think had it not been for that kind of fierce dedication verging on obsession, <laughs> um, <laughs> then I wouldn't have got my big break. 
um, the job that I had working at Lunar Wave. So I taught them. I was also uh, the studio manager, which was great because I had a lot of skills from mm. like working in hospitality for years, um, at kind of holding that space for people and being the sort of anchor. Um, mm. So it served me really, really well in the long run. Yeah. However, I mean, I definitely don't feel as much pressure now as I used to to create content. Absolutely. But it can be problematic because then your practice becomes a means for creating content. That's it. And, and I... like your practice is your home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your practice should be a space where you can like reconnect to yourself via your breath, your body and the awareness of those things like intermingling together. And when there is the awareness of there being a camera there, even if you're deep in the practice, like it, it becomes, there's always like some little part of your brain that is aware that you're filming this and your intention is to share it with people so that you can get more numbers in your classes mm -hmm. so that you can make more money. Uh -huh. um, so I think developing really strong boundaries with that mm -hmm. was also a difficult process for me yeah. because it's like, okay, now I need to not, I need to actually stop doing that. I need to stop filming myself all the time because my practice no longer feels like it used to and your practice will always transform over the years that's completely natural but if you're not getting from your practice um a certain sense of grounding then it's like well what are you here for am i just here to perform mm -hmm. um and when you also come from a performance background <laughs> that's already like it's already something that's in your mind yeah um, yeah so yeah i think when i stopped like religiously filming my practice i actually practiced a lot less and then i struggled again with like redefining what my practice meant for myself um, mm -hmm. and sometimes it is just a case of like taking the focus off the physical practice for a bit and focusing mm -hmm. on breath or focusing on meditation or mm -hmm. the yamas or like whatever it is that you need to do to reconnect with living in a yogic way mm -hmm. um but yeah it can be a complete mind bug it really is and like i remember in my early days of when i was teaching like i would again like you religiously film mm -hmm. my practice and there were points where I would repeat, repeat, repeat the sequence until it looked picture perfect. 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 Exactly like what yeah. the Insta yogis would yeah. share on their like yeah. Instagram. And I was like, why am I doing this? I'm not only like exhausting myself, getting repetitive strain because I'm doing it on one yeah. side and also moving really deep into the pose, like for no real reason. Yeah. And it well, took me yeah, flexibility is glamorized as a result. Oh, so <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, I can't. <laughs> More validation. Oh, oh yeah. god. <laughs> but it's like a, again a question of like ego. It gets so confusing mm. being a yoga teacher and having an online platform. Mm. Because if you think about it, you're like you're fueling my ego in a way, right? By people liking my content, engaging yeah, with yeah. me as a person, as a personality, coming to my classes, liking that. And it's it's sometimes such a mind fuck to like yeah. deal with. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's very strange. Isn't it? It's so strange. It's, I had someone recently come to class, a really sweet person, really, mm. really lovely. And I was like, I recognize your face. And why, why do you recognize your face? She's like, oh, I've been following you on Instagram for quite some time. And it was really nice to be like, oh my God, there are actually real people on the other end of these phones. But it was, yeah, it's quite a surreal experience when you're like, oh my God, you know, you kind of know me. You know a facet of me. Yeah, 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 um, exactly. Because, you know, that's all that it can ever be. Like, there's no mm -hmm. way that you can ever share the complete fullness of yourself yeah. via a two-dimensional space exactly. um, that <laughs> promotes you being one-dimensional, mm -hmm. which is obviously hugely problematic for yeah. so many reasons but yeah it can it can feel very very strange when people comment on your life or your practice because they've seen it online mm -hmm. and when people are like oh you're so good at yoga and of course you have to you're like but what, what you do yoga. yoga yeah and I think that there's obviously always an element of like people don't know like I literally had a conversation with someone the other day that literally didn't know what yoga was he just thought yeah. it was like stretching yeah. and showing off yeah. <laughs> and I was like dude no like that's not what it is and I had to explain it to him but it's like having that compassion I think when you're so <laughs> when you're so deep in so many years of practice which I mean I make no claims to say that I'm like a good yoga practitioner or whatever like what I, even is good I, exactly yeah. like who even knows what that is but it's 
it's hard, I think, sometimes to actually remember that people just aren't educated and that's fine because there's plenty of stuff that I know nothing about that I have completely like wrong preconceptions of. Um, but it makes me feel icky when people are like, you're good at yoga. And I'm like, I have a specific body type. It means that I have a predisposition to being good yeah. at certain practices with my body. Mm -hmm. And I've also spent a lot of time creating strength, which means that I can do those things Absolutely. with the range of motion that I have. And if that's what you think yoga is, then I guess maybe I'm good at it. But like ultimately what you're seeing and judging me on is I can acrobatic practice mm -hmm. um so it's, <laughs> it's like yes am i good at becoming one with all that is in the universal energy of the world probably fucking not but we like can, maybe can do a king pigeon yeah <laughs> i got it that's all that matters guys oh, you can stop listening now like, we, we've sold we've it. sold it like, completely yoga the, the deeper you go in a pose the closer you are to god oh, absolutely yeah. absolutely <laughs> Man, you know what one of my other like biggest icks? I fucking hate ick anyway. It's a gross word, but <laughs> But one of my other like gripes, so that's a better word to use. One of my other biggest gripes with being a yoga teacher is with mm. people, and I've had this so much recently. Yeah. It's like, oh my god, you must like just never be stressed. Like <gasps> Like I had a student actually say to me once, she was like um oh how are you getting on i'm like oh i'm not gonna lie like life's pretty stressful right now and she was like what do you mean like you i can't imagine you live such a cool life you must never be stressed i was like okay hang on let's unpack this for a second <laughs> the one percent of my life that you see on instagram is yeah. my highlight reel and yeah. also my business profile and yeah, the like is. one hour a week that you see me in the studio it's also like a performance in some way yeah i'm trying to be like my best self so I can hold space for everyone and not yeah. bring my shit in. So I don't yeah. know what the fuck you were judging it on. Oh my god. So my <laughs> one of my favourite teachers of all time, who I like fangirl over so much, mm -hmm. is Jason Crandall. And him and his wife have this amazing podcast. And I like listen to it like I'm such such a whore for that man. <laughs> um just FYI for like his teaching and his like way of unpicking things. I find it very, very um entertaining and clear and enlightening. But he says that he was like what did he say? He basically said something along the lines of that when you see me in a teaching space, that is one of the best hours of my week. That is me being the pinnacle best version of myself. And I think that that is so true because, you you know, there is a performative element to teaching. And when I first started teaching, having come from a performance background, I was very adamant that I didn't want to perform. I was yeah. like, I want to be authentic, as real as I possibly can. And um, I think when I started teaching, I'd also come to the realisation that I am not very good at being vulnerable with people um mm -hmm. at least in my romantic relationships anyway that's yeah. something that i have struggled with quite a lot um you know just like masking things with humor and like sarcasm and just oh, being what like, do you mean sassy <laughs> um rather than actually being like oh that really hurt yeah um so i was, I was <laughs> say what <laughs> um i was very adamant that i was like this is going to be um a tool for me to be more vulnerable with people because i want to actually model that behavior for others because i think when we're more honest and more vulnerable, we can potentially create a better planet. Um, yeah, I've got big dreams. So um, it's terrifying. The first class I taught after doing my teacher training, I was I hated every minute of, really? and I was like, I never want to do that ever again because I felt so exposed in front of these people. And my only other experience of being in front of a group of people like that was performing on stage. I had the mask of a character to protect me, and the vulnerability that I was expressing was funneled through the experience of a character that wasn't me. Mm. So then to go into a space where I was like, I'm just going to be myself, I'm going to be unapologetically me, um, was absolutely terrifying. But it was the fear that I felt and the strong feeling of I never want to do that again that led me into doing it more because I was like, well, this is obviously where my work is. Mm. Um, <laughs> so that was a fun That's so experience. Interesting. Yeah. And I know that both of us are pretty good at <laughs> being unapologetically ourselves when we arrive to class, for example. Like, yeah. I had a shit week last week. Yeah. Like, I went to class and I was like, headwinds, rain on yeah. my bike, I was stressed, and I arrived for seven minutes. And like, I went in and I was like, right, we're all going to lie down. I'm exhausted. <laughs> Let's just take a moment to arrive. Yeah. And like, when you 
show yourself as being human human people yes. respond well to that so well and it's like also it's it's also a self-protective thing right you're less you're having to put less energy into creating like this whole facade that everything is okay mm -hmm. like i did that earlier this year for way too many months and mm -hmm. that exhausted me it's tiring it's to constantly so tiring. putting that on absolutely a lot of an energy drain i think mm -hmm. um the more human you can be the better like yeah. um there's a quote again i don't know who it's by but it's like you're a spiritual being having a human experience <laughs> and yeah i come back to that all the time because i think it's incredibly true like mm -hmm. there's a lot of spiritual bypassing that happens in the yoga and the wellness industry <laughs> the mere fact that it's an industry i'm like oh um but it is what can you do and um there's this this kind of preconception that you have to have everything figured out and that you have to have everything figured out and that you have to be perfect mm. and um people aren't perfect like mm. we, no one's perfect perfection is not something that exists anywhere in nature at all um the, the the use of the word is actually just like mildly offensive i think because it's just like well what does that even mean like it, it just doesn't exist and i think you me to like that yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got, like such a wide expanse of experience in the like short 28 years that i've been alive mm -hmm. and that has been a wide spectrum of color and I think that when you kind of cut off either ends of the spectrum to kind of reduce yourself to perfection and you use like um, your yoga practice or your teaching practice or whatever it might be to express that need to be perfect, you're ultimately, you're doing several things. You're A, not modeling behavior that gives your students and your people to um, be imperfect and messy, mm -hmm. which is really sad because we all need space to be imperfect, mm -hmm. like we all do. Um, you're also, reducing your own capacity to experience like the wide breadth of emotion that we have the potential to experience in this life. Like I truly think that if you're cutting yourself off from like the negative emotions, which again, I find a problem with because I don't think that there's really such a thing. Like obviously there's harmful emotions and there are emotions that are incredibly unpleasant to, to experience. Mm -hmm. But when you put a negative and a connotative on it, con <laughs> Oh. <laughs> when you put a negative or a positive connotation on something it again reduces it to being either good or bad and it's like you're a human being and you're just here to experience and i think that yeah like when you cut things down like that when you cut away the bad you also cut away the capacity for the good as well so you just like start walking down this very narrow line where there's like no wiggle room there's no gray area, there's no, gray area. Yeah. there's no wiggle room there's no space for you to actually explore who you might want to be mm. um so i think it's yeah it's important to model that behavior there's so many times that i've gone into class and been like what up guys i'm hungover today let's do some <laughs> yoga um, and i just think it's really important to do that mm. like not necessarily to go and teach hungover like... <laughs> but also show that you are a human and i think yes. it also breaks down the hierarchy of the yes. and teacher yes. and it's like yes. mm, that, don't, that shouldn't exist that's a hierarchy i feel so just so so much discomfort with yeah well. absolutely it's like yes i am the teacher and i am mm. guiding you but there is no hierarchy just because i'm the teacher doesn't mean that i'm better than you no it's way. such an old school way of thinking yeah and also, I've said to students multiple times, I'm like, take everything I say with a pinch of salt because yes. I do not know everything. I'm still a student in myself. And if you disagree yeah. with something I, I say, Sick. would you? Well, exactly. Like, like, cool, go and explore something better. Yeah, exactly. Like, go to other teachers' classes, go to other types of practice, like, move your body in ways that mm -hmm. is not just yoga. Exactly. Please. Because, <laughs> you know, we're each so individual. And although there's like a general, picture of what most people in the West do with their bodies on a day-to-day -day basis is FYI it's basically just sitting down um <laughs> sorry what um yeah everyone's body is going to respond incredibly differently to different things and like we see it all the time in class like people's body types range so massively you know um so something that feels really great for one person will not feel really great for another yeah and I would hate for people to think oh but jazz said that it should feel this way and it doesn't feel this way so i'm just going to keep doing this even though it feels like my kneecap's going to pop off and you're like um please don't do oh, that no. please listen to your own body because yes. i think ultimately my my job and our jobs as teachers we touched on it briefly earlier but it's mm -hmm. like 
our job is to empower people so that they can make the decisions for their own body, for their own energy type on any given day, mm -hmm. for their own like mental space, so that they feel a sense of ownership over themselves. Mm -hmm. So that then if I offer something in that room, whether it's a pose or a breath practice or whatever it is, they've got enough foresight and enough self-knowing to go, yeah, I'm not sitting well with me today, I'm going to do yeah. something else. Yeah, exactly. Um, so... Which ultimately is a shit business model because you're basically <laughs> putting people into a place where you're like, run free, I, you don't need me anymore. Um, but, you know. Yeah. Well, I have always said to like students, particularly like one to one clients, mm. you shouldn't have to rely on me and work with me forever. Like, yeah. That's, that means I'm not doing my job. Exactly. Well enough, right? Exactly. So, yeah, it's, it definitely is a shit business model. Yeah. But hopefully, as the practice continues to expand and reach yeah. a bunch of other people more and more people come towards totally. you like oh cool i think there is also something about accountability as well yeah people coming back to group group classes mm -hmm. um yeah it's it's yeah. a big one yeah yeah definitely and i was talking to a friend about this a couple of days ago and they were like why is it that when i pay someone for therapy or when i pay someone for a yoga class or whatever it might be I go and do it without any qualms whatsoever. When I pay for therapy, I can meditate in that therapy and it's totally fine and I don't have an issue. Whereas when I'm just at home on my own and I try and do yoga practice or exercise or whatever it is, I I have either got like the clock ticking down in my head or I'm really resistant to doing it. And I just suddenly thought like, it's because the person that's holding the space for you or the studio, whatever it might be, has assigned a monetary value. Mm -hmm to that thing mm -hmm. and you're agreeing that that's the value but when you're the one facilitating space for yourself there's no agreed value and if you don't have yeah I know like, my fuck <laughs> like if you don't have the intrinsic um knowledge belief and wisdom and the experience to go like yeah okay I'm not paying anyone to hold the space for me but I know that if I don't do it I'm not going to feel as good today mm -hmm. And you don't have the like self worth to actually put those practices in place to look after yourself. Mm -hmm. It's going to be much harder yeah. to step onto your mat or your meditation yeah. pillow. Or yeah, because it's also coming back to like decision. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also coming back to the decision fatigue. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like you're making that active choice. Yeah. to create space and time for yourself. Yeah, and it's like I know that I'm not as I'm not as necessarily like strict with myself either. Like mm -hmm. I would much rather clean the house than spend time meditating for me. I'm like, why yeah. do I not believe in myself work? It's interesting, isn't it? Cause I also think when you've had a yoga practice for like, for me, it's like pushing on 10 years. I think mm. it's about the same. Like mm -hmm. you, there's no way that those things can't feed into the other aspects of your life. So like we were talking about the other day, we were talking about you like weightlifting and moving your body and like, non asana based ways and i was like yes but your bedrock of movement is asana so there's going to be a very large proportion of how you practice movement that is in some way yoga mm -hmm. and it's, it's the same with like cleaning your house or whatever or like for me it's cooking a meal like mm -hmm. i put some music on how are my ingredients out i feel incredibly present and i use the practice of cooking food to a like practice ahimsa to myself because I'm cooking myself a nourishing meal and B to be like present and practice a, an element of meditation I suppose mm -hmm. because you're you're there in the moment performing the action mm -hmm. um just kind of moving yourself through it that's exactly it and I feel like with the majority of movement and modalities the more experience you have in it the more you realize that it is a moving meditation practice mm -hmm. like I was talking to someone else about this the other day like yeah. Every time I step up to the barbell and I'm about to do a lift, it is the process of like arriving there, mm -hmm. making sure I've like found my grip, I've found my foundational position and everything else, all the noise goes. Yeah. Like I don't, I can't hear anything apart from my breath. Mm -hmm. I move when my breath is ready, when mm -hmm. my body is ready. And it's just like, it's this real, it's coming back to like how I used to practice asana yeah. and it's fed into so many other aspects of mm -hmm. my life and I think like that's just something you can't necessarily teach or learn directly mm -hmm. it's just something that somehow just happens at some yeah. point yeah. and it's not always a conscious decision for me at least I was like mm -hmm. oh cool I'm moving in ways that I didn't think I would ever <laughs> it's interesting as well isn't it because I think um there are so many things that you say when you're teaching or things that you might read, mm. perhaps if you're studying philosophy or just like reading a book that's maybe got a bit of a spiritual vibe to it. And I think also just as a caveat, like 
spirituality isn't this woo-woo thing that you need to ascend to experience like spirituality is actually a deeply human thing it's just like being present with yourself it's like being here and now mm -hmm. and every single human being has the opportunity to experience that should they choose to and actually every single human being will experience it at some point in their life whether it's just like watching a watching a sunset or something like cringy and lame like that where you just feel this incredible sense of like presence or like being in the pits with those negative emotions mm -hmm. and feeling feeling the despair or feeling whatever it is you're you're present with it there's no way you can't be um and i think it's funny because there's certain things that i say as a teacher when i'm teaching um, as a facilitator of space that i know i actually feel truly but i know that they might not be received to the depth that i mean them until those individuals or the community whoever it might be is actually ready to receive them in all of their truth. And also those truths will transform over the years as well. It's like when I come back to, there are certain uh, sutras that I was coming back to earlier in the year to um, just try and ground my practice and ground my teaching. And there was one sutra and I just kept re re revisiting, just revisiting it every single day. I'd sit down with the same book, read the same page over. And every single day I like understood it on a slightly different plane in a slightly different way. Um, and I think it's the same with these kind of spiritual yogic practices. Like they'll transform with you in your life as you experience more of this, like being mm -hmm. human, mm -hmm. um, which is a really beautiful thing. Yeah. You don't have to understand it all right now. No. You will understand more of it in the future and you'll look back in the past and be like, oh, I understood that to a different capacity then. And now I understand it to this capacity. Mm -hmm. And it's all down to your lived experience, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like in that regard, you're practicing non-attachment, right? You're like... <laughs> Big time, maybe. Yeah, and I think that's been one of the biggest um, aspects of the practice that I've taken into like my wider sphere of yeah, life, like non-attachment to yeah. certain emotions or certain relationships. I'm not to say that like I'm completely ignoring them. No. I sit with them, experience it, see how it feels, but I'm mm -hmm. not going to let that negative or positive emotional whatever it is like then dictate the rest of my being for sure right and just being like yeah my life experience is malleable it's going to change on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. and it's all fine yeah we navigate the waves <laughs> i think i experienced that a lot when i quit acting um because i had to let go of the perception that i was an actor like my ego I suffered like an ego death for sure and around that time as well I was also going through some stuff like with a relationship ending that ended uh, quite messily down to my own kind of quite destructive behavior um, and it was a really difficult time because suddenly I was confronted with the fact that I didn't actually know who I was without being an actor oh my god didn't know, yeah it was like this black hole of like who <gasps> am I now and that's that's terrifying but it, it it taught me a lot of really good lessons about um non-attachment for sure because you're going to suffer different ego deaths throughout your life you know people will leave you people will die mm -hmm. your job might get taken away from you very suddenly mm -hmm. you might think of yourself as a really good person and then find that you do something that doesn't align with the perception of what a good person does mm -hmm. um you know all of these different things might happen that really challenge your personality and your ego and i think having the ability to um like deconstruct and also disconnect yourself and detach yourself from all of these sort of facets of your ego that your that yourself your self being has sort of constructed mm -hmm. uh, is incredibly useful and it's not to say that you need to like wear orange robes and just be like i am no one and everyone i have no identity i don't know who i am who am i you tell me like you don't need to be that kind of person you can absolutely define yourself by the things that you like and the people that you enjoy spending time with um and all of that stuff i think is very important because ultimately your ego is there to protect you yeah. but it's also very healthy to practice a, a, a you know like a dose of detachment and like yeah just not not get too sort of wound up in the idea that you like have to be xyz and we, we've spoken about this before and that like there's this perception in the yoga world that like you have to be vegan or vegetarian or like super super skinny or white or whatever it might be to practice yoga and like i sometimes feel myself being a problematic person like perpetuating this idea that you have to be like a slim able-bodied white woman to practice yoga because i'm like just like disclaimer that is what i am oh, yeah. but 
you know, it's... But the difference is that your intention for the practice is mm -hmm. very wildly different. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And it I always boils down to that. Yeah, like, it's just like checking in with yourself and yeah. just being like, actually, how am I, especially if you're sharing things, like mm -hmm. sharing content, for instance, yeah. which is so difficult to um, actually communicate the wide, the wide expanse of your, your experience and your intention. Mm -hmm. um, it can be quite difficult to not fall into that space of like, look guys, I can touch my toes or mm -hmm. do a back bend or do something mm -hmm. crazy. And like, this is the, the ideal that I'm perpetuating by doing that. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's kind of natural to sort of question yourself, I guess. And I hope that people would, yeah. especially if they fall into that category. Yeah. Um, and also like question what it is you're choosing to share and the language that you're choosing to use. Like certain words like calling yourself a yogi. And I'm like, mm, these questions, <laughs> like that is, an incredibly disrespectful thing to do like I'm not coming at anyone by saying that but just if you're someone that is like I am a yogi just can you actually like look into what that like what that actually means it's it's a term of respect that is given to people that have practiced yoga not just asana my I add mm. for like years and years and years and years and traditionally like in India someone that's a true yogi isn't calling themselves a yogi they're being that's like it's a, name you know, it's a name given to you it's gifted to you by the people around you and it's a term of like incredible respect yeah. and for us as people in the west just using it willy-nilly um, <laughs> you know i i think it's very natural for yoga practice to transform and change and it, and it will always do that it's mm. such an old practice like there are always going to be things that evolve about it but like there are certain things that i'm just a bit like e <laughs> And I remember, question like, it. <laughs> I question remember, it. <laughs> question everything. Question everything. I remember us two actually having this conversation mm. a while ago. Yeah. When it comes to yoga teachers in the West using Sanskrit, mm. and like my decision to not use it, mm. very very different to your decision for using it. Yeah. And it's really really fascinating to kind of hear. And again, it's like I said, it's all down to intention. Yeah. Like I personally don't use Sanskrit, just due to like personal reasons and stuff that I'm dealing with from trauma from yeah. my childhood yeah. but then like to hear your perspective was so refreshing yeah. because again like you've come into it with this intention with this understanding and like you've respected the lineage in mm -hmm. ways that perhaps a lot of people might not spend time doing yeah um and yeah I found that really really like refreshing to mm -hmm. hear I was like oh yeah damn how do you like brought that perspective yeah you know yeah but that's hard to come across like intention is hard to like share that on instagram right of course it is yeah yeah for sure mm -hmm. yeah and i think both of those perspectives are right in their own way um and it's funny because I, I went through this phase of being like if i'm using sanskrit i have to pronounce it exactly perfectly and then i realized that again my my tendency to be a perfectionist was creeping in and i was like i want to use sanskrit as well as i can as a form of respecting the roots of the practice and the people that this practice ultimately and originally belonged to. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that the practice belongs to any one person now, or, but I think it's very important to um, respect the lineage and like mm -hmm. the deep cultural roots of the practice mm -hmm. ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I was like, oh, actually, if I say Ardha Chandrasana wrong, then that's fine. Yeah. Like no one's judging me. It's pronunciation. It's, right? Yeah. And it's like, if I also, you know, if going back to that thing of being like, if you call yourself a yogi, please question it. Also, like, you're allowed to get things wrong. If you decide for yourself that you're actually fine with calling yourself a yogi or whatever it might be, then that's also like none of my business. Like, you are perfect as you are. And if you want to use terminology or whatever it might be in the way that you want to use it because of your own intention, and that's also absolutely fine. But it's just, I think having that space to question yourself, also question that attachment that you might have to maybe those terms or those reasonings, mm -hmm. and then just kind of make your own opinion about things. I think that's also, you know, it's allowed and it's important. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, I kind of wanted to regress a little bit. Yeah, let's regress. <laughs> regress. <laughs> Going back to what you were talking about earlier about like, ego and self-worth yeah and, <laughs> it's a big one it's a big one and how like the practice has kind of influenced your life mm. do you find that you're able to now 
live a little bit more like intuitively in some regard? Yeah, definitely, for sure. Um, I think through several means, um, by doing a practice that is focused on interoception, so that's like my body's own ability to internally um, make sense of the kind of internal sensations that I'm feeling, whether that's physical sensation or emotional sensation, and then like make sense of those things. Having a practice that supports that has really helped me to center in a lot more on uh, like in moments where I have to make a decision and if I'm not sure about like whether I'm gonna make the decision to do something or not do something and I'm really unsure like mentally where to go with that. I recently had this thing of like connecting into how your body is actually feeling mm -hmm. and if your body is feeling a sense of like constrictedness mm -hmm. at the prospect of doing said thing then maybe that, that's not such, you know, maybe that's a decision that you need to actually move away from. Mm -hmm. And if you're feeling a sense of like expansion or relaxation, like in your body, like I'm talking physical sensation, I'm not talking about some, you know, out there concept of like, do I feel expansive in my Muladhara chakra or like whatever <laughs> it is. Um, I'm literally talking about physical sensation, then maybe that's something that you want to expand into. Yeah. Um, and I think living intuitively, oh man, it's been such a, big journey for me because you know there are certain things that that society teaches you you need to have in line by certain points in your life especially being a woman <laughs> and um i think whenever i have ignored my intuition the feeling that i initially had that i ignored has always come out of the wash to be the the thing that i thought it would be Okay. Whereas when I like follow my intuition, it's strange. Like I just start to see signs around me that make me feel like I'm on the right path. Um, so that's been quite a, a kind of enlightening thing recently. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to challenge your ego and just be like, okay, my ego is telling me that I need to be doing this thing because these, this is the personality that has been shaped by the belief system that is influenced by the context of the world that I live in. Mm -hmm. And then actually just connect to the, like, the body experience of your life. Um, man, that's hard in a world that's like, what's your five-year plan? What do I know? <laughs> I'm like, I'm, it's yeah. a five-year plan, I don't know. Yeah, it's, well, it's so <laughs> great, right? It's like, oh, by this age, you should be with someone, you should be planning, like, you know, your house, your kids. Yeah. Like, what, what yeah, it's very, it's been very interesting recently. We spoke about this, but um, I, about three months ago, separated from a fairly long-term partner, and it was all like, very nice and you know quite an amicable breakup as far as breakups go and both my sisters one of three sisters my older sister and my younger sister have both had like quite large things happen in their life my older sister's just had a baby my younger sister's getting married next year and I don't I don't think that I've particularly spent my life feeling this sense of like oh I'm, I'm on the clock like I mm -hmm. have to have these things in place by a certain time mm -hmm. but when two people that are arguably like the closest to you in the yes. world have these two very big like things happen that are on track with society's mm -hmm. um, kind of uh, path as it were or like society's like clock whatever you want to call it um yeah that was pretty terrifying for a little second there I was like I'm getting left behind I don't know how to feel um yeah I really felt a sense of like comparison there mm -hmm. um so it's been it, yeah quite an enlightening experience to move through that and just be like no actually their lives are great but I don't want their lives I want yeah. my life and I you're extending a hint to yourself then in that regard thanks <laughs> baby girl yeah I'm trying to I think that's ultimately what it boils down to you know I spent a long time throughout my childhood and my teenage years and probably my early 20s as well actually being pretty unkind to myself in several different ways and um, learning to be kind to myself and to be compassionate to my own experience I mean it's still like an everyday process I'm still like growing into that but yeah absolutely yeah so like kind of to go on that topic ahimsa means non-violence mm -hmm. and a lot of people go in within the yoga within the wellness sphere equate that to being vegan so we, <laughs> we were kind of talking about that earlier right like as a yeah. yoga teacher a lot of people just assume automatically that you are vegan mm -hmm. um and don't get me wrong like i was i was vegan for the first like yeah. two years of my teaching i was vegan for a while right and like even on the yoga teacher training all the food was vegan yeah a little bit vegetarian but like predominantly yeah. like vegan plant based, plant based yeah there is nothing inherently wrong with that but oh, what's no. problematic is when people attach ahimsa to mm -hmm. 
the style in which you're eating and if you're not following a plant-based yeah. diet it's like and i would i would even go as far as to say that it's actually problematic when there's the convergence of like yoga ego and, mm -hmm. and how we eat yes those three things together um can be an absolute shitstorm. Oh, what dark triad. <laughs> oh my god it's such a dark triad like i think almost every single yoga teacher i know like on a personal level has had some kind of eating disorder or disordered eating habits or just um, even about their body yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 100 absolutely um i think it's yeah, it's really problematic um, because, yeah, I guess ahimsa, there's a definition that says it's like uh, the, it's the expression of like benevolence, kindness and love in your thought, your action mm -hmm. and your intention. So it's like all those three things. And um, I think that there are ways that we can learn to become more ahimsic if you want to use that as a word yeah. um in our life but i think it's incredibly hard to be a completely um ahimsa led person i think it's a practice in itself like the yamas are things to be practiced they are not things to perfect i don't mm -hmm. think and like sure if you move into a place where you are perfectly practicing ahimsa then like more power to you absolutely amazing but i think where i struggled um I think I was like on and off vegan for like quite a long time. I was vegetarian for a really big portion of my life, like probably from the age of nine till I was like in my early twenties. And, and some of that time I was vegan as well. Um, for all of that time, I was struggling with my body image with like um, bulimia and um, orthorexia as well. Eventually is where I ended up landing, which for those people that don't know, orthorexia is like an unhealthy obsession with eating healthily. Mm -hmm paradoxical I know um but it it was definitely it fed into the belief that to be a yoga person I have to be basically deliciously Ella and it was around that time that that you know deliciously Ella was like super popular and everyone was you know doing that whole like oh I'm gluten free I'm dairy free I'm I don't eat nuts like it was it was this kind of convergence of all of these different things and again it boils down to the fact that online the content that we were being shown was these like beautiful healthy looking happy people that had their shit together and that just happened to eat a plant-based diet and when you're searching for that desperately and you have incredibly low self-worth um and a healthy dash of self-loathing as well mm -hmm. in there uh, it can seem like quite a, a good swift way to, to maybe start liking yourself to maybe feel worthy of to the like yourself yeah to feel validated by yeah. other people or yeah. even like not even validated in a good way but no. to be commented on me like oh you're vegan and it's like oh yes. someone's finding yeah. interest in me yeah wow okay i'm gonna live off this mm -hmm. and it's such a toxic amalgamation of a head fuck yeah. <laughs> well it's like what? performative virtue signaling mm -hmm. Um, by way of what you're eating, especially if you're sharing any content on that as well. Um, I remember being very, very scathing of people that ate meat or dairy. Um, you know, I remember like, I'm going to use the term brainwashing. I mean that not lightly, like, <laughs> like literally brainwashing myself by watching like um, Forks Over Knives and like Cowspiracy and all of these documentaries that um, ultimately yeah, it's, it's good to know the truth of things. Like, I don't think that it's wrong to watch these things and to make mm. to make um, decisions that you have kind of formed based on watching the, that kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you are just taking things at face value and using and allowing the scaremongering to mm. back you into a corner, especially when you're already very susceptible to quite obsessive behaviours, yeah. um verging on maybe even addictive behaviors um if they're causing harm to yourself then you're not really practicing ahimsa and i think that that's something that i began to realize a few years ago when i really started to just let go of the need to restrict what i eat yeah um, and started to eat from a more intuitive kind of place i just mm -hmm. was like shit man like i wasn't practicing ahimsa those years mm -hmm. yes i was not eating animals i was not exploiting animals in any way to get the food that i was eating mm -hmm. however was i exploiting you know people to to eat the quinoa that i was eating was i exploiting people to eat the avocados that probably been shipped like thousands of miles across the world 
who knows what the working conditions of those people yeah, were. Exactly. And ultimately, I was, you know, not performing particular kindness to myself or my mental health either, because either, I wasn't, I wasn't like now when I eat, I'm eating to nourish myself because I'm moving towards a place of greater self compassion and love yeah. and acceptance. Um, and acceptance is really all we can hope for. But back then I wasn't, I was doing it because I felt deeply, deeply um, undervaluable and I didn't have any self-worth. And I was eating that way because I thought it would give me the validation that I was seeking. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a real dangerous kind of territory when you lack the self-worth in yourself because you inevitably like project onto people, which is mm -hmm. definitely what I did. Mm -hmm. It's like, the judgment that comes from it and you can't say that you're there practicing ahimsa because you haven't started with yourself so you cannot extend that to other people right? yeah yeah and it becomes really really tricky when there is a yoga teacher who's vegan and then pushes their own ideals and values onto yeah. their students about being vegan like yeah i've experienced that before and i've even heard of like yoga teacher trainings where they force their students to watch like Forks Over Knives and mm. Conspiracy and again be like you have to be vegan to be a teacher and it's like what is that what is that achieving? What message is that giving? What, is that, what message is yeah. that giving as well? And like that's such a narrow framework to live by. And not everyone can number one financially afford to be vegan. For sure. It's a privilege in a lot of regards to mm -hmm. be and to lead that lifestyle. Not a lot of people's genetics will allow them to thrive on that diet. Yeah, sure. But again, also like the emotional attachment that we have to food. We cannot tell people how to eat. Mm -hmm. And again, like we have no idea someone's relationship to food and their body. So the question yeah. of Himza is out of the picture when someone's like forced ideals are pushed onto others. Absolutely. Big time. And then when you kind of throw in the ego as well. And yeah. You know what we were talking about earlier the importance of being able to practice detachment from your own ego mm. and from the facets of your ego that have developed and formed over the years if you're all attaching your ego and your identity to this ideal of being a plant-based person or mm. a vegan or an earthling whatever it might be <laughs> don't puke um <laughs> puke <emoji. laughs> it's it's yeah it's problematic as well because mm -hmm. It, you just never know when those parts of yourself are, are no longer going to be there and also I don't think we spoke about this earlier like having an ego isn't a bad thing like everybody needs an ego mm -hmm. you can't exist without one exactly. you would be a jellyfish like you know what, were you, what would you do um, you have to have one because it keeps you safe but yeah. what you can practice is the systematic and kind reminding of just like being like, hey, ego, are you in the driving seat right now? Mm. I think you are. You need to get back in the passenger seat mm. because right now what's driving is like compassion and love and critical thinking and yeah. also a sense of intuitively led living. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the ego is there stomping its feet, it's like a petulant toddler. Like, yeah, you don't want to try and force it to submission. You want to try and like, I think anyway, befriend it. And just be like, hey, bro. <laughs> What can we do to make you feel safer? Can we move you now like out of the driver's seat so that mm -hmm. the actual real values and principles that I've chosen to live my life by can mm -hmm. actually be in charge? Um, yeah. Sweet. Well, now is a point where I like to ask you three questions. It's just a bit random. I can want so random. Oh my god, so like, random. Like, so random. Such is like so totally random. <laughs> I'm surprised we haven't done accents yet. Oh, no. Holy shit, this is crazy. So Holy shit. <laughs> so my first question to you is, as a kid, if there was one skill that you could have learned, whether practical or movement based, oh. what would it be and why? Can it be magical? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> um, definitely it would have been to like grow gills and learn how to swim, like breathe underwater. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, man. That would oh be so my god, I was obsessed with a little mermaid when I was a child, yeah. and I just really wanted to be a mermaid so badly. So yeah, if I could like breathe underwater mm. and explore the ocean floor, Sick. I'm there. Yeah, but mine yeah. would have been to fly. The nice. amount of dreams that I had where I would like jump off the sofa. Oh, and such then, a I know, right? <laughs> and then like I'd catch the air wherever the fuck it was in yeah. the drift. But then I'd be doing like breaststroke. 
in the air. I just swim. That. I used to swim, 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 fly like that. Swim, fly in my dreams, yeah. right? I'm and actually, it's a, it's a, when you dream about flying, it's a, it's a good omen. It means that you oh. feel like you're, you're free in your life. Interesting. Yeah. But then, yeah, I do remember actively getting up on the sofa and like trying yeah. to jump and fly and be like, if I was able to hover in the air just a second longer, yeah. I think I got it. Obviously, never no. happened. But <laughs> we digress. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, my next question. What is one bit of advice that you would give to your 20-year-old self? Because I feel like 16-year-old self is very overdone. Yeah, 20-year-old self. Oh, God, who was she back then? Right? Oh, man. Oh, man, I would just be like, don't waste your time trying to be skinny or trying to impress boys your energy your intelligence your creativity is so much bigger than that mm. spend time on yourself do the things that you love without having to feel like you need to come up with a reason for anyone else other than yourself mm. follow your joy yeah oh, that's nice <laughs> it's funny because like again you could always argue with this kind of stuff you wouldn't be where you were if you didn't go through that experience. Oh no, right. yeah, I wouldn't change anything, but I think, I do think but back I sometimes, and I think about how much energy I put mm. into the belief system that as a woman, your only worth came from being beautiful and attractive and the uh, object of male desire. Um, uh, yeah, it, it saddens me to think about how much energy I put into that and how much energy I put into like thinking about the different ways that I could make myself sick or, you know, yeah. the different things that I was thinking about not eating. I'm like, I have a brain that is capable of so much more than that. So yeah, that yeah. makes me a little sad. But no, no regrets. No regrets. No regrets. Nice. Okay, final question for you. And it's just escaped my head. No, it hasn't. Um, <laughs> if you were to choose a song for your life right now to describe how your life is or whatever your feelings, what would it be? Oh my God. <laughs> That's such a hard one. It is, isn't it? Um, oh. And this doesn't mean, it, this is like you today. Okay, me today? Yeah. Me right now, today, how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. I feel pretty good. Hmm? <laughs> I feel pretty good. Um, I would probably be... Mm -hmm. Come on. Um, oh my god, my lid's got that's fine. You take your time. I will think as well what mine is. Yeah. See, hard question, hey? Very hard question. Um, oh, I know. Okay. I've been listening to Taylor Swift's new album on <laughs> repeat, <laughs> and there's this song on it called Karma, and I freaking love it. Nice. So that would be interesting. Because I'm uh, obviously just really living that, like, <laughs> calm in life right now. <laughs> yeah, I love it. That's that's the vibe I'm on today, guys. Nice. Nice. Yeah. nice. Interesting. Yeah. What might be? Hmm. It's really hard because sometimes, you know, when you catch a song, yeah, and you just like go ham on that song. Oh, yeah. And you're just like, oh my God, I've played this about five times today. That's literally me and Taylor's new album. We're like this. I don't think we will to every song. It's been in <laughs> less than a month. Yeah. <laughs> no. I don't think that much now. A few times. I love it. Yeah. Hmm. What song would it be? This is like, whatever, this is what I'm feeling right now. Yeah. I think it's by a guy called um, Brewski, mm. and it's She's Just Not That Into You. Oh, brutal. I know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, lol, lol, lol. What does that say about where I am right now? We don't need to unpack that. No, we don't. We don't need to unpack karma either, guys. But... <laughs> <laughs> there are so... some lyrics in there that might give some people some ideas. <laughs> That's literally with this song, too. Leave it over to you guys. Um, amazing. So to kind of round off, where can people find you? I'll put the socials. Oh, yeah. So, so you, can, you can find me in several different places. Um, I have an Instagram, obviously, which is jazz, J-A-S dot Newsome dot yoga, which will be somewhere around here. Um, I share kind of uh, educational things, musings. Like I break down poses sometimes. Sometimes I'm just chatting shit and sharing my life. <laughs> um, there, I have a website which is jasmineuseofyoga.com where you can find all of my classes, like public classes, um, as well as a blog which I am constantly adding to because I'm a very avid writer as well. Mm. Um, and I also have a 
podcast myself, which I actually haven't added to in ages, but there's some like meditations and musings and breath work practices on there as well. And that is called the Body, Breath and Being podcast. And you can find that on wherever you listen to your podcasts. Woo! So yeah, those are the main places. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for chatting to me. It's just about you. Yeah. <laughs> like, we always have such a great chat, so it's nice to be able to, like, kind of extend that to other yeah. people. So. And prove to people that we actually don't just chat total shit when we're in the house. <laughs> <with them. laughs> also, we got we matching do do that tattoos. Too. We do do that. But to commemorate our time together, <laughs> we got matching tattoos yeah. of the yeah. demons. It's very, very cute. So big up to Karen. Big up to Karen. Yeah, she's the best. <laughs> but um, yeah, thank you so much for watching, guys. If you are curious about any of the links, everything is in the description mm -hmm. below. Really appreciate a like and a subscribe. It means that we can continue to create this content. Yeah. So do it. Olive's the best. <laughs> she's the best. All right. Big love. We'll see you next time. Thank Bye. you.